Washington coast, a story begins about wilderness and people, and mountains 200 miles from the sea, the Wilderness Alps of Stahican, in the North Cascade country that was once all of it as wild as the sea, the wild shining sea, shaping the earth through the ages, never the same, yet not to be changed by man, who long ago learned to accept it for what it is, even as we are now learning not to change some of the wild land, but to keep it natural, to seek from it answers to questions we may yet learn how to ask. There is wild garden to keep natural, to preserve in a national park, high above the city, yet far below the ice cap, the sea put on Mount Rainier, Wild gardens and glaciers from a timeless sea. These we have set apart, unmanaged, unspoiled. We have also spared the stillness of a rainforest, where trees can live out their full span and return to the earth they came from. All that lives here repays in full for value received, nourishes as it has been nourished. Scores of centuries built this the Olympic rainforest, a cool green world, hushed as a prayer. Man could wipe it out in a decade. Instead, two decades ago, he consecrated it as a park, not to be impaired, a place where all generations could come to know the dignity of nature. This for all people, thanks to the vision of people. People who nearly a century ago made Yosemite the first park to be reserved for the nation and the world. In the early years, many other parks were set aside. Grand Canyon at the beginning of the century. In mid-century, the Wilderness River Trail of Dinosaurs Echo Park Country was in danger until Congress reassured its safety. The people appreciated it in the nick of time. But what of Monument Valley, where the first Americans have lived how long? A land that is as it was, its beauty somber, lying quiet in an eddy of civilization, protected only by accident. Such places belong to our National Gallery. They are the last of our primeval landscapes, the few surviving samples of a natural world to walk and rest in, to see, to listen to, to feel the mood of, to comprehend, to care about. There isn't much of it left. What there is is all all men will ever have and all their children. It is only as safe as people, knowing about it, want it to be. In the northern Cascades, back of Lake Chelan, there is alpine wilderness that belongs to our natural gallery, too. But do enough people know about it? We flew in to look it over. A deep canyon and lake, a few miles of road along the lower edge, cliffs and glaciers in a forest setting, some places to camp and fish and climb. These we'd heard about and about a conflict between those who wanted to use the raw materials here and those who wanted to preserve natural beauty. But we weren't prepared for what began to unfold, an amazing wilderness of rugged Alps built in grand scale, unique, unsurpassed anywhere in the United States, a crown jewel of America's scenic grandeur.
Our flight was too hurried, too cut off, unreal for us to feel the country or remember the shape of the waves of the storm-tossed sea of peaks. We knew it was great country, big country. We also saw that its size alone could not protect it. On the west side, men were already clear-cutting the last virgin forests. Getting timber and pulp from the forested avenues of approach needed very much for primeval setting and living space to look at and to look from. Cross Cascade Pass in the heart of this wilderness. And you are but a few minutes from other wild forests, also wanted for their timber, needed as setting too. Up a side canyon from Lake Chelan, we flew over a clump of buildings of a mining town, deserted now, the ore played out. The people moved away in a matter of weeks. Their marks will be there for centuries. This had happened here. It could happen in many other parts of the Cascades. Would America have to go without much to leave its finest wilderness unspoiled? Back in Chelan, we wondered. Chelan, a pleasant town that knew that some of its raw materials were waning, but did enough people know that its remaining heritage of natural beauty could be perpetual? Chelan, gateway to the American Alps, ringed with apple orchards, basking in the sunny foothills at the foot of America's most remarkable lake, enjoying the usual water sports of swimming, boating, and water skiing, but what do the visitors see of the unusual opportunity they have? Chelan's matchless backcountry. The boat heads toward it every day. Did people see enough from it? We boarded the Lady of the Lake to find out, and she moved toward a promised land, finding her way where no road goes. Penetrating a deep fjord, floating 1,500 feet above the canyon's floor, a floor that is well below sea level and 9,000 feet below the high peaks of the upper end, America's deepest canyon. Four hours and 55 miles of floating lazily, of unwinding, looking at the waves and cliffs and clouds. Watching the peaks rise higher and higher. The peaks that tower high above the last port, Stahican Landing. To the Indians, Stahican meant the way through. But to our fellow passengers, not the way through, but a place to turn back after an hour's pause for lunch. Had they seen the real country yet? The map told us that Stahican was many things. A little cluster of resorts, a deep valley, a handful of natives and near natives who own the cabins, a river in a hurry, easy trails like the one to Coon Lake, and the lower end of a primitive road that can take you back into the real country if you'll let it. The road starts at a handsome lake shore and dead ends in paradise. It connects with no highways and doesn't compete with any. The few cars on it know each other by their first names. It is seldom far from the river, and if you stop for a close look, no horn blows behind you. Great trees tower over the road. Flowers and grass go alongside it. And between the wheel tracks. It's bumpy enough to slow you down to see the roadside. It doesn't cut in and shoulder its way through. It treads softly. In no hurry to someplace else. It's there already. We turned in at High Bridge Camp to look up two people camped there who could tell us where to go when we wanted to try the trails. I dropped the reins of the Jeep, a Jeep with a mind of its own, 
and with my boys Ken and Bob, walked over to get acquainted with Chuck Hesse, an expert Washington mountaineer, and his wife Marion, an expert too. Their favorite address is somewhere in the North Cascades. We get out the map, and they showed us where they had been. They knew the country we had flown over to see from a soft cushion through a window and far away. They had felt it underfoot. They had spent the time you need to spend in our speed-shrunk world. When you want to feel the size of space, when you want perspective, you can earn the best of what this country gives, they said, only if you do it yourself. So they walked the trails, climbed where no trails were, carefully, where the tundra was steep. And they reaped the special rewards of those who walked where no one walked before. They watched the cloud cap two miles high on Glacier Peak, the strange lenticular cloud that the wind blows through, leaving a cloud there, as the magic of the camera revealed. They had shared the high country with the real natives, the rare mountain goats. And like the goats, they had walked past the skylines of high domed glaciers. They knew the alpine gardens and meadows, early in the summer and late. From the ridges, they had dropped down into the valleys, where last winter's snow lies close to the color being mixed for next autumn. They had seen the ptarmigans change from summer plumage to winter. And they'd seen the countryside do the same thing. The Hesse's have been among the few to know this country when it is most spectacular of all, when the green world turns to white. Chuck and Marion advised us to stay low a while to wake up our walking muscles. Then they saddled up and went on to explore anew. Taking their cue, we strolled to Rainbow Falls, most beautiful in Stahican Valley. remembered the easy trail to Coon Lake. And walked up to watch mayflies play with its reflections. And to pick our way over the big beaver dam that created the lake. Then we walked out to our canyon side balcony to look up a mile to the top of Agnes Mountain and down on the primeval forest that the Hesse's had said was such a wonderful corridor into the great Agnes country and its big glacier basins. We only had time that day to explore the Agnes Trail for a mile or two, to see what a wilderness forest is like when man leaves it to its own wondrous devices. We walked waist deep in ferns, quietly, looking backward on the eternity that has made this forest what it is. Then another day, with a late breakfast in Stahican and lunch in our pockets, we went on past the end of the road on a walk into Horseshoe Basin to sample its high gardens in friendly places.
Under the high peaks, an old avalanche told of the fury that winter can bring to this country, and a darkening sky promised a mild bit of summer fury, too. traveler is seldom bored by blue skies, but then monotonous weather can't build mountains like these and their glaciers and forests and flowers. We liked the way the mountains looked and discovered how to like what made them that way. Don't scurry for cover and miss the show. Stay out and be part of it. Not on a high peak, of course, but take a walk down in a sheltered valley. So we walked out into it, heads up, and felt the freshness the rains bring, saw the new pattern, smelled the wet leaves, now washed and cool. And we looked up to see the old contest between the crags and the mists. We got wet and our feet squished a little in our boots. But what never gets wet can never get dry. We got both. We never came back from one of our walks wishing we hadn't gone out. And we never came back feeling only half alive. I guess the boys knew it all the time and I rediscovered it. Epidermis is waterproof and the rain is only water. And that strange tingling, that was just my circulation circulating. I'd almost forgotten the feeling. Then we were ready to pack up into the back country, the real wilderness. Ray Courtney got the stock ready, and Grant McConnell and his daughter Anne came along for company. You know about pre-teenagers. How does a girl break the barrier with men interested only in practical things? Well, anyway, you can get a horse's attention. It's a little impressive. And this is the safest way to get a tumble from a horse. In its own quiet way, the thaw begins, the slow thaw. Meanwhile, Ray made knapsacking easy for us, if not the horse. And we were off through the virgin forest, riding toward the meadows and highlands of Park Creek, up under some of the giants of the North Cascades and their many glaciers. A few hours ride, and we were close to the pass, making camp. Our own mountain world spread out around us. Each clump of trees a timberline penthouse, each room perfectly air-conditioned. Unpacking can be hard work, so the boys rested. But not Anne. She got her kitchen appliances ready. Whereupon the boys decided to help her bring in squaw wood so we could get a fire started. Nearby, her father tried hard to find where I hid the soup. However precarious your kitchen may be, you can't beat a camp in these timberline gardens with sunset on the high peaks and supper around a campfire. Never mind what the cook is mixed up. If it doesn't look too fancy, wait until it gets dark and you won't have to see what you're reading.
Then trade stories around the campfire, far into the night. We found Park Creek Camp a wonderful base for strolls high above the pass, a chance to enjoy the world of tundra and tarns. We had never seen better country to walk in. From our eyrie, we saw rugged trees clinging high above a hanging glacier. And while we watched, an ice avalanche broke loose and thundered down a mile-high wall, happily a long way from any of the trails. Nearing our high point, we watched new snow water trickle over old moss. Then climbed up to our roof gardens. Close to the mists that poured over the shoulder of Mount Buckner. This was real country. left the snow-filled pass behind us. And a marmot scampered up to his observation post to look us over. And an alpine flea moved in to look him over. A mother grouse led us down the trail. Then came back to see what was keeping us. What kept us would keep anybody, huckleberries, the biggest you ever saw, the bushes loaded with them, dark, ripe, and juicy, each tasting good as a huckleberry should, and as only a fresh, wild, ripe, colossal huckleberry can. Bob worked fast. And so did Ann. be a lean year for the bears. But Ken was the deliberate type. Was he collecting enough for a big, super juicy mouthful all at once? This would be about enough. But no, no, chivalry was afoot. But let's don't overdo it. What a difference a few years would make, I thought, as we rode on. Forest again. Then right into a waterfall. The waterfall Doubtful Creek makes as it comes down out of Doubtful Lake. And up to Timberline once more, under Magic Mountain, and on to Cascade Pass. Deep in the heart of the little-known Alps of the North Cascades, seemingly remote, yet here we met at noon a friend who left New York City late the night before, a whole continent away. 
Our friend had come up this canyon, one of the west side avenues into the mountains, like the White Chuck in the Seattle. And it was up still another of these canyons, the Sauk River, that the boys and I came a few days later, this time with our whole family. Up through a virgin forest with huge trees, almost a rainforest, still as a cathedral. In it, a clear stream from an unscarred watershed. Our trail climbed grassy canyon sides to the small shelter centered in its own private elf below White Pass. Johnny needed help for the last mile. He was only three. His sister Barbara was six, and she made it all. The big boys carried packs. They were veterans now. We walked in with the Sierra Club group, whose food and duffel and kitchen and cooks had been packed in, a wilderness trip costing $6 a day. Less for the children, who didn't need much packed in. And after all, Johnny couldn't pack much in himself. From our camp, everybody explored the Alps, poked along the park-like high trails, wandered through the miles of grasslands, let the mountain wind blow away flatland cares. Almost everybody got out on a glacier, too. The White Chuck Glacier's flat ice field is made to order for beginners. And we kept looking for a hole in the mist through which to glimpse the monarch of this country, Glacier Peak, the same Glacier Peak we had flown around and soon would walk around to see from Image Lake a really classic view in the unspoiled northern Cascades. We looked back at our Alps as the Lady of the Lake took us down to Chelan. We looked back again from a forest lookout high above our lake, deep in its slot, winding into the heart of the Alps of Stahican. We watched the sun set And we stayed all night until dawn brought a flush to Glacier Peak. The sun would light all this mountain land soon. And we hope it will always reveal wilderness there. In the avenues of unspoiled forest. In the flashing waters of the side streams and the river. In the friendly lower gardens and grassy outlands, up at Timberline and in Tundra, on the glaciers and peaks, other people will want to be walking our trails, up where the tree reaches high for the cloud, where the flower takes the summer wind with beauty, and the summer rain, too. They will want to discover for themselves the wildness that the ages have made perfect. You have a right to discover it, I told Ken and Bob, and your children and theirs too just as we did. They can discover it. But only if we keep some wildness in between the shining seas. Only if man remembers in his rising tide not to engulf his last islands of wilderness. <laughs> 